Why do we need to know about Jesus being a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek? Why do we need to know that Jesus holds a priesthood that is permanent by the power of his indestructible life? We would all be fine just to go, he's a better priest who's got a better covenant, who is in God's house. We would be great with that. We talk about that. We teach that. Why do we need this about Melchizedek? Verse 25 is the point. Verse 25. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. The CSB reads, Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, since he always lives to intercede for them. The updated New American Standard, not the 95 update, but they did it again in 2020. The updated, updated New American Standard. Therefore, he is also able to save forever. There is this amazing picture that Jesus is able to save those who come to him completely. He is able to save them to the uttermost. He is able to save them all the way through thoroughly and forever because he lives to make intercession for us. And I want the words of verse 25 to truly sink into you for a moment. Why is Jesus in heaven in that heavenly temple and what is his purpose what is he doing verse 25 he always lives to intercede for you the point of his indestructible life is to emphasize He's constantly there interceding for each and every one of us. This is a concept that is hard to understand. Not because it's complicated. It's hard to understand because the love that the Lord is showing us is just amazing. To read things like this. The the book of Hebrews is filled with these kinds of statements about how God loves us. I'm blown away that earlier in the book that you have Jesus being said of us, he's not ashamed to call us brothers. You have to be kidding me. I'm ashamed of myself. How can he not be ashamed of me? Not ashamed to call them brothers. Do you understand all my sins? Here's Jesus saying, I always live by the power of my indestructible life. To make intercession for you. As has been brought up a few times in this lectureship series, Psalm 8 is so powerful. Who are we that the Lord is mindful of us and that he cares for us like this? And yet, I want you to think about how many times God is trying to emphasize and communicate to us that he is there for us to deal with our sins. One of the key points that the Old Testament is trying to emphasize and show and drive into our hearts is that he is the place of atonement and cleansing. One of my favorite images and visions of that is in Zechariah 3. You go, Zechariah. Yeah, I know, but it is a great vision. Zechariah 3, Joshua the high priest is seen in this vision. The high priest is supposed to be wearing beautiful, clean vestments before God. And he is described as wearing vile, putrid, awful, disgusting clothes. And he's in the presence of God. 
And we're told that the accuser is right there, ready to accuse him. And rightfully so. Look at his clothes. They're disgusting. They're despicable. They're awful. They're defiled. They are vile. And the most shocking thing happens in the vision. In verse 2 of Zechariah 3, the Lord does not turn to the high priest and rebuke him for the vile, filthy clothes that he's wearing. He turns to Satan and rebukes him who is about to accuse the high priest. The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. If we had read the vision of Zechariah 3 and the Lord had turned and rebuked the high priest who's representing Israel for his abominable, defiled clothes, we would go, yep, that makes sense. You can't come into the presence of God like that. And that's right, you can't. And yet in this vision, somehow he's standing there and rather than the high priest receiving the rebuke, Satan does. It doesn't make sense until you keep reading the vision. Because in verse 4 you read that it was said to him, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. How many different ways does God say, I know you're filthy, I know you're dirty. I know you're full of sins. But I'm here to clean you. I'm here to take the accuser out of the picture and to cleanse those sins, to make intercession, to clean you up and set you right in my sight again. You know, as much as this is a stunning picture, that God is trying to show us that we are not too filthy for him, that the mess is not too great, that the sins are not too deep or too vast or too grave, but that God is willing to take our filthiness and cleanse it. You can relate to this picture that God is giving to us. If you're a parent, I, I'm sure I'm not the only one who has experienced this when you had one of your little ones. I had a time when I was home with one of my little ones, and my wife was out. And I was sitting there in the rocking chair with her, rocking back and forth, just watching TV, thinking it was going to be a simple evening. <laughs> All the parents laugh. <laughs> when suddenly she decided it would be that moment to just simply fill me and the rocking chair with as much vomit as possible. When her head got done spinning, I looked down at myself and her, and I thought, what am I going to do now? There is no one to call. <laughs> Here I am. And you know what I told my daughter? I told her, well, clearly, because you're so filthy, I'm going to have to trade you out for another daughter. <laughs> I mean, you're gross. This is ridiculous. I didn't sign up for this. That was not in the manual when I said you're going to have kids. That would happen. So clearly, I traded her out. No, what does the parent do? We figured out a way to gingerly and carefully get into the bathroom. And I got her into the tub, and I began to cleanse her. It's not hard to understand the image that God's trying to communicate to us as a father. That we sometimes look at this and go, oh, well, I'm too filthy. Well, you don't understand the relationship if you think so. We say, well, you don't understand. Well, you don't understand the relationship if you think that. In fact, friends, the, the 
beautiful passage that we know so well. The suffering servant of Isaiah 53. Don't forget to emphasize its ending. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sins of many. Now watch. Watch how it all ends. And makes intercession for the transgressors. God is trying to say it to us over and over and over again. I'm here to clean the filth. I'm here to wash the dirt. Your sins are not too great. Your filth is not too much. Just as a parent does not say, well, I can't have this child anymore because of the filth. God does not say that to us. He says, I'll clean you up. Romans 8 is one of our favorite passages, isn't it, that ending? He says it there, too. Romans 8, verse 32, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? How many times does God have to say to us, if I went this far in giving my son, you don't think I'm going to take you the rest of the way? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Will he not also graciously give us all things? Now, he's not done. Feel the Zechariah 3 picture. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? You know, if I'm, if I'm right there, I'm writing in, well, there's a lot of people. Got a lot of sins, a lot of charges, a lot of accusations. God's answer, it's God who justifies Who is to condemn? Isn't that the scene of Zechariah 3? Here's the high priest, filthy clothes. Accusations ready, condemnation coming. Who is to condemn Christ? Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God, but don't miss it. Who indeed is interceding for us? This is what verse 25 is driving at in Hebrews chapter 7. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for us. He's there for that reason. The whole reason he came was so that he could intercede for us. And we sometimes, we're full of the filth and we're full of our sins and we go, well, I can't come near to God. Don't you see how messy I am? And here's Jesus saying, I live to make intercession for people like you and me. That's the whole point. Don't run from God. Run to God. Look at verse 26 to drive that home. For it is indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins, and then for those of the people since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For a law appoints men in their weakness as high priests. But the word of the oath, and I'd say parenthesis, I think Psalm 110, 
the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. He lives to intercede because he died for us and rose from the dead, showing his indestructible life and becoming our high priest. All right, final couple minutes. Let's get to the so what, because that's where I started with this. The author of the book is writing to Christians who are suffering, and he tells them, you have need of endurance. He writes to Christians who are in prison. He's writing to Christians who have suffered loss. He's writing to Christians whose faith is weakening. He's writing to Christians who are having the tendency to drift away. He's writing to Christians who are on the brink of falling back. And he's bringing forward Melchizedek as the strong message of hope. He said that back in chapter 6 in verse, 20, in verse 19, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. In verse 19 of chapter 7, he said, it is a better hope that is introduced. Melchizedek is the picture of the better hope. And here it is. You don't need to give up even when you're suffering. And you don't need to give up if you're struggling with sin. You don't need to give up if you feel the burden and the guilt of your sinful ways. You don't need to give up if you feel like the filth is too much. Friends, you don't need to give up. Even if you have this sin that you say, I am so tired of this sin, but it keeps getting me for years and years and years. The picture that we are being given is don't give up. Don't fall back. Don't Throw away this great hope that you have. Don't give up because you have a better hope. Jesus, verse 25, is able to completely save. Aren't you glad that didn't say he's able to partially save? You know, you, as long as you're doing half all right, he'll, he'll take care of the rest. No. He is able to completely save those who draw near to God. He is able to completely deal with our sinful condition. My question to you, if you have been teetering, if you have been on the brink, if you feel like you are losing hope, if you feel like you've been holding on and you only have one finger on, why would you give up? Because God has done everything you need so that you would not give up. He has given you everything you need so that you will not let go. That you will grab on even tighter. He has offered up himself so that you will not quit under the weight of life's pressures but rather that you would double down all the more. He's taken your filthy clothes, defiled by sin, and he has thrown them away, and he has put the clean clothes on you and placed you into service when you come to him. And verse 25 says, Jesus lives for that. Jesus lives for taking people with filthy clothes and tearing it off of them, cleaning it up, and giving them some clean clothes. He lives for that. That's why he's before the presence of God, and that's why he's interceding with an indestructible life. And that's why Melchizedek matters. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your Son, 
and his indestructible life so that he will always live to intercede for each and every one of us. Lord, it is a comfort to know that no matter how much time you give us on this earth, your son is always there interceding. Thank you for this great high priest. Thank you for the power of his eternal life. And thank you for your love to cleanse us for our filthiness. Lord, may you move us to have new hearts and new lives when we see that you intercede for us every day, every hour, and every moment. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Fantastic, Brent. Thank you. Appreciate, Appreciate that. So much. Thank you. Now I can get out of this crazy thing. <laughs> I know. I, when I got to the, 